Thanks, Greg, and um, welcome everyone. So today we're going to be talking about how to reliably establish Lakina. Um, the people who might know me um, will realise that I can probably talk for hours, if not days, about Lakina and how to establish Lakina. So today will be a very quick snapshot of, of some of the key principles and practices that are required to reliably establish Lakina, particularly in Northern Australia, so in our tropical and subtropical areas in, in Australia. So that's probably the a background there. So I'm just going to see if I can get my, there we go. So just before we launch into some of the key, key characteristics and factors, um, just wanted to provide some background here about what Lakina does for beef production systems in, in Northern Australia or our tropical regions. So provides high quality feed to improve weight gain of cattle. And this is predominantly when the grass quality is low. So so we, we, we find quite quite commonly that basically where there's lacuna in the paddock, the cattle can grow um, or have higher weight gains for longer periods of time. So from the spring right through to to, um, to autumn, and those times basically are, are, are typically typically outside when the actual grass is high quality. Provides more feed in the paddock, so basically there's 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 more tucker there, so we can or grazers can basically stock those paddocks at a higher higher rate. Um, and also, uh, Lakina can supply nitrogen for the companion grasses, which is really an important factor about legumes, and in particular with Lakina, can provide that nitrogen, which will incre increase the grass growth and the grass quality, and therefore help that overall pasture system. Um, this sort of last point here is probably a bit tongue-in-cheek in a way, but it's it's really, um, I suppose, that the point here is to, to actually think about Lakina as a high-quality supplement for cattle, basically. So. Lakina adds to the pasture system being our grass typically um, and so the, the actual intake of Lakina or the availability of, of Lakina is, is, is important but the intake can vary depending on what's happening but it basically goes with the, with the grass rather than as a, as, a, as a substitution as such. So a bit of a, of a background to the presentation quickly. Again Lakina is productive but needs to be well established for best results and I think um, that's probably one of the key critical aspects of Lakina. The presentation today will be really cover off on what I'm calling basic crop management or crop establishment principles. So these principles aren't new. Um, these principles are used by grain growers, cotton growers as such, and we are basically espousing those same or similar principles for our pasture systems, particularly legumes like Lakina. So, and so anyone who's had yeah, farming experience will, will know where I'm coming from with, with, these, with these points. And the premise of the presentation is that um, there's listeners today have sort of realised, well, Lakina probably is for me or, or could be for me, and they want to know more about how to establish Lakina reliably. So, so therefore, I won't be going into any of the background as to why you would plant Lakina, what production benefits and so forth. Um, it's really about, well, how do we actually get Lakina established on farm and do that reliably. So there's basically five points going to be covering off on today. So the first one is about the climatic needs of Lakina. Second one's about soil requirements for Lakina. And then we'll be covering off on the planning, preparation and planting. So this webinar today is basically one of, of in a series of two webinars. So this, this first webinar here today is really about the establishment side of things, how to get, how to plan and prepare and plant Lakina. And the second webinar, which, will, which I think we'll be doing Greg in a few months time, um, will cover off on the management, um, longer term management as well from, from there. So, so this will just be covering off in that very first section a bit where to plant it, how to plant it, and those sorts of details. Okay, so climatic needs. So it's a tropical plant, um, comes from southern North America or northern South America, if that makes sense, in that Mexico area through to sort of northern South, South, South America. Um, so loves, you know, warm, wet summers and mild winters, and that's the ideal climate for it. Um, prefers rainfall above 800 millimetres per annum per year. But in, in Queensland, or particularly in Queensland here, it's quite productive in rainfall below that amount, such as say up to 600, more well, between 600 and 800 millimetres of rainfall per year, but only really where it's growing in good, deep, fertile soil, and, and particularly with, with wider row spacings too. So, so again, our climate here typically is, is probably not the ideal rainfall for it, but, but um, with the appropriate management and establishment, we can make it work and make it productive. The second point is that it's very responsive to temperature. Again, being a tropical plant, 
needs to have this warm uh, summer conditions and mild winters. So when we're thinking about timing for planting and so forth, we want to make sure that the, that the, the temperatures are, are rising in spring and above 18 degrees for ideal seed germination. Maximum growth really occurs when the maximum temperatures are above 25 degrees C. Growth can stop, um, depending on, I suppose, that, that diurnal fluctuation or the maximum temperature as well, but growth can stop when minimums fall below 10 degrees. Um, and so it, it, it is uh, sensitive to, to frost. Um, mild frost can kill leaves, whereas severe frost can kill stems. And we see that quite commonly year in, year out in many locations across Queensland in particular. Um, but if the frosts aren't, aren't too savage or too severe and aren't too frequent, the plants will, will regrow quite happily in the springtime from the base of those, of those plants there. So we rarely see deaths from frost, but it can happen and it has happened in the past. Okay, what about soil needs? Uh, well, there's basically three, three aspects here. The first one is good deep soils. So th the deeper the better, basically, but we try and aim for around that one metre or, or, or deeper. And that basically comes back to having a high water holding capacity. So it's a, it's a plant that has a very big deep taproot and requires good deep soil to exploit that and therefore to maximise its potential. The second aspect is that th that the actual soil needs to be well drained. Um, Lakina has a low tolerance to prolonged water logging, so that subsoil drainage is very important. And many of our clay soils, in particular across Queensland, in our Brigalow Belt, for instance, um, can have um, very dense, very sodic subsoils, which are, have poor drainage. That is not ideal for for Lakina. So, so again, the ideal soils would be more the alluvial soils or, or light to medium clays. With, with well, well, good drained subsoils. And the third aspect is that the soils need to be ideally fertile. And there are a couple of aspects here. One is about pH. Um, pH needs to be neutral or higher, so more alkaline pHs rather than acidic pHs. Um, very, very important for looking at, particularly also thinking about the pH all the way through the soil profile down to that meter or, or, or greater. So because sometimes we do see soils with a um, adequate pH in the top soil, so it might be neutral to alkaline, but the pH might decrease with depth. That's not ideal. And the second aspect of being fertile is having high phosphorus, sulphur, zinc and potassium levels. And most, of, most if not all of those can be supplied through fertiliser if the soil isn't sufficient to start with. So all three of these are important. And m many grazers ask me, well, can I can I get away with you know having good good deep soil but but not well drained or having a really dense sodic subsoil and I say well not really you sort of need to have those three in combination to really maximise its potential. Having said that though it's a very tough plant can survive on some pretty ordinary soils so so shallow soils um, not that fertile and so forth and, and low rainfall conditions but you just won't maximise its potential. It's imperative to undertake a soil test if, if you don't know what your soil attributes are like, particularly how deep it might be, what that subsoil drainage is like, or what the subsoil conditions are like, and what those particular nutrients are like too. Um, so again, doing a top 10 or a top soil sample alone isn't sufficient. You, 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 you definitely want to sort of do a, a top soil, mid, mid sort of section and a subsoil section and actually analyse the whole profile to see what it's like. The other aspect about soil testing is to actually get um, appropriate advice as to how to interpret what that test means, because there are a lot of aspects there that are quite, well, can be quite complicated, and in particular for Lakina has pretty particular requirements, so my advice is to get advice. Okay, so we've covered off on the climate and the soils. Um, we'll cover off on these next three aspects being planning, preparation, and planting. So in this planning section, the key, key aspect is that Lakina is a long-lived plant. It, each plant will live for greater than 30 years. So any issues or mistakes or, or dramas that are, can occur during the establishment phase will be apparent every year for 30 years plus. So it's really important to get it right, right from, right from day one. So I'll be covering off on a range of aspects in this section here. Um, the first one is about which paddock, what's the starting point, row, configuration, right? configuration, when to plant, which variety, what seeding rate, what method, what machinery is available, what's required. 
and I'm and, and you could be thinking, well, why, why am I talking about these sorts of aspects in the planning section rather than at planting or, or, or so, and therefore, so, and I suppose my point here is that these are all critical aspects to plan right from the start, right before you even choose which paddock, um, get get the plough or tractors out and actually start preparing the actual countryside. So, you need to sort of address and think about all these way before you even sort of start thinking or start undertaking work in the paddock. So we'll cover off on these aspects one by one. So which paddock? So again, good soil, deep, fertile, well drained, as I just mentioned, that's imperative. Um, and that comes back to, I think, you need to choose a paddock that has high production potential, but is underperforming due to a lack of feed quality. So, so typically our pastures or grass only pastures have a protein drought for large periods of time of the year. Um, and, and, and the actual solution to actually correct that is to improve nitrogen supply, um, and we can do that quite adequately, adequately through a legume being the king in this case here. So, so the point here is also that if you've got a soil that's deep and fertile and well-drained, fertile might mean it's got adequate phosphorus and sulphur, those basic nutrients might, might be just low in nitrogen or organic matter and so forth. So those are the paddocks which should be sown first because it has the highest production potential. And that's where the best bang for your buck will be from an economical point of view. Next point here is about having adequate infrastructure such as fences, water points and so forth and getting or the ability to, to get cattle in and out when, when you need to. So that point's fairly straightforward I, I know but um, it's pretty imperative to be able to have key, key uh, infrastructure to be able to manage the cattle appropriately to pull cattle in, pull cattle out when you want to at the right time. The last point here is about referring to the Lakina Networks Code of Practice. Um, the Code of Practice, which is on that website there, outlines the management considerations to assess where Lakina should, should go to maximise its productive potential, but also minimise the weed issue or weed potential of this plant. So Lakina can be a weed, and if it's sown in, in the wrong um, place to actually start with, that can be made worse, basically. So there's a whole heap of information on, on, on that website there. Please um, have a look and read over the code of practice at, at your leisure. Okay, next aspect is about what is a starting point. So this might seem a little bit strange as to what, what's this all mean, what, what, what does this mean, but it's, it's really about, well, is a paddock already cultivated? If you've got a paddock that's already uh, been used for grain cropping or for forage production, that will alter what you do from, from there. So in this case here, if you've got a paddock that's already cultivated, um, either zero till or it's cultivated up with, 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 with cultivation, these sort of gear, um, the concept there will be to plant both lacina and grass together um, going forward. Is a paddock well grassed with desirable species of grass? Um, if that's the case, that's great, that's awesome. Um, therefore, from there, on, from here on in, I only need to think about how to establish lacina because the grass is already there, it's good grass, you want to have that grass going forward. Is a paddock poorly grass, so it hasn't got much grass, what's it's under, under um, performing? and or are the species there undesirable as well. If that's the case, I would suggest pretty strongly actually, to be honest, to fully remove that existing poor pasture and start again. Therefore, basically plant lacina and grass together going forward. So I see many paddocks where the grass production is low or is poor and, uh, and, and grass makes up a, a large proportion of the intake of the animal's um, diet, so we want to make sure that we have good grass in amongst our good productive lacina. Are there any suckers or other regrowth or, you know, timber in the way, basically? And, and I suppose the concept here is if you've got suckers or regrowth in the way, that will, you know, m markedly upset your ability to, ability to establish lacina there, so we want to basically control those first and then work out what to do from there. And we don't have time today to um, outline what the actual process could or, could or might be, but again, control those suckers or regrowth first, then, then work out what's the best thing from there. So depending on the starting point as to where what your, what your chosen paddock is like at the moment will dictate what machinery you need to have, uh, what inputs are required and the costs and so forth. And clearly if we've got a cultivator paddock already, the costs are much lower than if you've got a, a paddock that's got poor grass or undesirable grasses and so forth. So Oh, it's, it markedly alters the cost of, of the actual establishment phase. What about row configurations? Now, now, 
this is a fairly complex and a fairly complex sort of, sort of uh, I suppose, issue and can be a bit of a can of worms, really. The first aspect is about row alignment. Um, which way sh should the rows be aligned in the paddock? And I suppose the first point there is about, well, depends on the slope. So if, if you actually do have slopey country where you want to put Lakina across that and it's fairly steep, I would suggest that your row should be along the contour rather than up and down the hill. If the rows are up and down the hill, um, there could be some issues with erosion and so forth during the establishment phase, but also longer term, the cattle tend to sort of walk pads either side of the Lakina rows where the grass doesn't grow, and that means water could run down those, those areas and cause erosion. Um, the other point here is about um, thinking about which way the cattle will flow when mustering that paddock. So if they, if they happily move one direction or towards a water point, for instance, will ideally align the rows in that direction to make mustering easier. But if you've got good dogs or other, other, other mechanisms, it might not really matter, but just sort of be, be thinking about that too. This last point about alignment is about which direction east, west or north, south should the rows be? And there's, and there's been some, some, some thinking about, well, maybe east-west might decrease the shading of the grasses in between the lacina, therefore provide good sunlight and good growth potential for the grass having the rows that way. Compared to if the rows are north-south, um, as the sun comes up in the east, the actual grass will be shaded in the morning, only get full sunlight in the middle of the day, and then we'll get shading again in the afternoon. So that might not be ideal because most of our um, most of the sown pastures, grass pasture species that are applicable for Lakina um, are not that shade tolerant. Row spacing, again, a bit of a can of worms here and, and really hard to sort of um, put down in one, one or two points about what the, what the ideal is because I don't think there is an ideal. Um, I'm suggesting a range such as between 6 and 12 metres. And I'm suggesting here again, if you've got good soils with good at water holding capacity and it's fertile and the lacuna will grow very well and or with irrigation, I'm suggesting go, go, go wider rows. That might be 10 or 12 metres or something like that. If the soil's a bit shallower and the production won't be as high with the lacuna, maybe bring the rows a bit narrower together to try and have more plants and therefore more, more, more lacuna in the paddock to make sure there's enough lacuna when the cattle are actively targeting it. And the third point here is about uh, single rows or twin rows. What's the best thing there? And again, I don't think there's any real, um, I don't know, really any real sort of hard data to support either way. There's some rules of thumb. Um, historically, single rows were, were sown, but, but commonly today, twins are, are what's planted. Um, twin rows basically provide the opportunity of, of making sure there's a, there's a row down every single patch of the, of the paddock as such. Uh, whereas if you've got a single row and, the, and if there is an issue with planting or establishment, there's a gap and Lakina doesn't compensate that well for, for gaps down the row. Okay, when to plant? Um, well, basically, again, being a tropical plant, um, the temperatures need to be warm enough for germination of the seed and then good adequate growth right through the actual seeds. And so, in our tropical or subtropical regions, that really means from spring or roughly September right through to end of autumn, roughly March, I suppose. So the actual planting window, therefore, can be as, as wide as that from, from, from September right through to March. And depending on where you are, it will depend on you know whether you do go in, uh, in September or you wait until, until more summertime and vice versa at the end of the season too. Whether, whether you're frosty, more frosty or less frosty is, will depend as to how late you, you want to plant in that window. Want to also basically time the actual sowing to when you've got the highest chance of obtaining full rainfall. So again, for, for anyone in tropical or subtropical regions in Northern Australia, that, that really means summertime. So from December right through to February would be probably the best time to maximise the chance of getting full rainfall because that provides the best chance of getting the plant away as quickly as possible so you can graze it as soon as possible too, which is this last point. Basically, we want to basically plant as soon as we can um, in, in, those, in those periods of time to, to ensure a good robust plant going into the winter or the dry season and that way also will facilitate an earlier graze. So we, we want to make sure there's enough moisture in the ground but, uh, and, and plant early enough though to have a, have a nice, big, robust plant going into, 
into the winter time. Which variety? Um, again, this might seem a bit sort of a bit silly to have to be talking about which variety in the planting section before we've been planted, but um, there has been some issues in recent years of actually getting getting sort of seed of, of your preferred variety. So um, thinking about what variety is suitable for you needs to be thought about and planned right from the get-go rather than a week or two before planting as such. So if your locality is that you're in more coastal areas, which is more humid, where psyllids are more prevalent, um, the variety that I would suggest would be most suitable there is, is Redlands, which is a, a psyllid, or highly psyllid tolerant variety. Um, very productive um, and has been some good trials being have been occurred in recent recent years and indicates that it's it's quite palatable for stock and they do put weight on there's no, no issues there so if you are in a coastal area where psyllids are, are prevalent more times than not just plant redlands if you're further inland where, where psyllids aren't a bigger issue and so, sorry by the way psyllids are, are insects that are, are sap sucking insects that can markedly defoliate the, the, the plant and really markedly reduce um, productivity. So if you, if you are inland conditions, so away from the coast where it's um, hotter, um, less humid, um, one degrees Taramba or Cunningham, which is the oldest of those three there, um, are quite suitable. And there are some differences between them. Um, one degrees has some solid tolerance and cold tolerance. Taramba can be quite arboreal or tree-like or fairly tall. Um, it has some solid tolerance too, and Cunningham can get touched up by psyllids quite, quite, quite readily. Again, that will therefore be uh, that variety only therefore really be suitable for inland conditions. Um, but it's quite productive, is bushy, um, and is widely sown today. Other aspect about which variety and seed in particular is about to make sure that you source and, and can get the right rhizobia. So when you actually do come to plant, you actually have the rhizobia there on hand. And so the Lakina strain is what's called CB3060, um, easily sourced through your retailer or reseller. Um, and so in this planting session, definitely think about how you are going to apply the seed at planting time. Um, this this uh, rhizobia comes in two different forms, uh, freeze-dried or peat. Um, and the freeze-dried product is basically in a small little vial, and that will do 250 kilograms of seed, whereas a peat product will do 50 kilograms of seed. What seeding rate? Um, well, typically we sort of suggest for around that two kilograms per hectare. Um, so therefore, if you've got 100 hectare paddock to actually plant, you'll need 200 kilos of seed. If you've got good moisture and a good seed bed and a precision planter and everything's hunky-dory and right to go, I have seen quite successful um, stands um, planted at one kilogram per hectare or down to. Um, ultimately, it comes back to being a being a tree type plant, um, we sort of more talk about in, in how many seeds per metre of row, and, and, and the recommendation is around about that 20 seeds per metre of row, which means each seed's about five centimetres apart down each row, um, with the aim to establish 50% of that, so aim to establish at least 10 plants per metre of row, and hopefully from there you'll have a very good productive stand going forward. And there's a picture of some um, Lakina seed there to just show the size of it. Seed quality is very important. Um, we want to make sure that when, when you actually do get your seed, there's a seed test that comes with it or get one done yourself if, 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 it, if, if it doesn't come with one um, when you buy it. But you want to make sure the germination is high and I'm suggesting here arbitrarily, I suppose, above 80%, but the higher the better. Um, the seed must be scarified. It's, it's quite hard. Um, or, or dormant when it's freshly um, harvested off, off the plant. So it needs to be um, mechanically scarified to break that dormancy. So when you plant it in the ground, it will be soft or germinate and will come up on that moisture. Large uniform seed size are very helpful, particularly if you're gonna be using precision planters, which I'm suggesting that everyone should. So having that uniform size will help with that seed evenness and placement down the row. And make sure there's no other insect damage or holes drilled through the seed, no other weed seeds and so forth in that seed lot too. What method? Well, basically it comes back to what's the starting point. So if you've got a paddock with, with good grass, that's very productive and the right species that you want going forward, there are two ways of planting lacina, either in strips, uh, which is basically um, a process where you take out or remove grass in strips and we sort of I suppose the recommending that those strips are at least four, if not five metres wide, um, or you could um, prepare the whole paddock 
take take the whole paddock out of grass and, and start afresh. If the grass is poor quality or undesirable species, I'm suggesting whole paddock only is the best way to go. So again, re removing what's there and starting again from fence to fence, that will, that will provide the best production and probably the most economical cool, um, benefit as well long term. If you've got no grass, clearly you have to plant the whole paddock to grass and lacina. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, if you've got suckles of regrowth in the way, control those first and then reassess from there. What technique? Always plant the seed in the moisture. There's been many sort of questions over the years, well, can I just broadcast seed on top? Well, I would suggest that's a very unreliable way of, of, of establishing lacina. Um, it's a fairly big seed, can be planted in the moisture, will come up quite reliably in the moisture. Always plant it in the moisture in the ground. Self-mulching soils could be sprayed out rather than cultivated and then drilled or, or, or plant the seed in the ground. Whereas if you've got hard setting soils, um, ideally they should be cultivated to provide some sort of seed bed and some sort of tilth, and then you can drill the seed into those. So what do I mean by self-mulching soil? Well, here's a picture here of a, excuse me, a, a black cracking clay soil up near Emerald in the Central Highlands or Central Queensland, showing that it's basically self-mulching in that it's actually got a seed bed under its own, I suppose, own, own nature really. It's sort of, it's crumbly, it's friable. Um, you don't need to prepare or, or cultivate it to get a seed bed. It's, it's, it's already there um, naturally. Compared to this other example here of a hard setting soil that in effect sets like concrete, um, pretty repellent for, for, for moisture. Um, and that situation here, I would suggest that maybe it's best not to give it a, a cultivation or two to get some roughness, some some um, some tilt about it, some friability. So when you do come through with, with the planer, you can get that good seed soil contact. What machinery is required? So basically suitable machinery uh, to cultivate if that's the way you, you wanna go. So cultivation gear might be a, uh, so an offset discs or a chisel player or scarifier or some sort of cultivator. So whatever gear is required to, to create a seed bed and, and control weeds during a, a fallow period. Or alternatively, what sort of, um, or, or, or get some sort of spray gear to spray the weeds in the fallow. So that might be a large boom spray that you can get across the country quite reliably and spray some weeds. Ripper, um, question mark on that point, um, I think the, has been some some research that indicates that uh, yeah, ripping the rows before you plant lacina is 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 beneficial, particularly on non-cracking um, clay soils as such, so hard setting type soils. Uh, whereas on the soils that that crack a bit like the the photo I showed before, if it's go back on that top right hand side there, that's naturally cracking soil. You might not see much benefit from from um, from ripping the actual those those rows to actually start with. So um, horses for courses and soils for soils. So obviously just uh, depends on the, on, the, on the situation. Um, and a planter that can precisely place seed uh, with press wheels. Um, and ideally if the planter can also fertilize at the same time, spray weeds at the same time, and water inject, water inject rhizobia at the same time, that's the ideal scenario. So that would be the ideal planter. Uh, but, 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 but primarily the actual planter must be able to place the seed reliably down the row, so the actual placement in the row, and also place that seed at a, a uniform depth as well. Um, lastly, about spray gear to apply herbicides post planting or some sort of inner row cultivation gear. So after planting, once the actual lacina crops up and going, uh, the ability to control weeds post planting is gonna be imperative. Okay, so I've just covered off on the actual preparation side of things. Um, now we're gonna move into, um, sorry, I've just covered off on the planning side of things, we'll be talking about the preparation from here on in. And there's three or four aspects here. The first one is about conserving moisture prior to sowing. And the aim of it, or the concept is to basically have a full profile of moisture, or at least say two foot of moisture in the ground before planting occurs. And depending on, on where you are or your, your location therefore, and therefore the rainfall that's received and that seasonal conditions as well, that might mean a fallow six months to 12 months or even longer, depending on what rainfall you do get. So it can take a number of months to get a, a good body of moisture in the ground before you plant to provide that reliability of establishment. So for example, if you wanna plant in February, um, I'm suggesting here start, start a fallow period roughly 
June, July the previous year to, to ensure there's enough soil moisture to, to accumulate prior to sowing in a normal rainfall year. Again, if the rainfall year like we're having now is much drier, the fallow period should be, or must be longer um, and therefore we might have to sort of delay planting for another 12 months um, potentially. What's a fallow? So basically a fallow is, is, is a process where we are killing the existing grass or weeds for a period of time so it's a moisture which comes from rainfall can accumulate in the soil prior to sowing and basically provides or enables that re reliability of, of establishment. So having that moisture bank in the ground before you plant uh, mitigates against not getting follow-up rainfall soon after and therefore those plants that have established can use that subsoil moisture to survive on until the next rainfall event. The next aspect about preparation is, is to uh, provide or produce a, a good seed bed that's suitable for Lakina. What that means is basically a fine seed bed to ensure good seed soil contact. Um, the seed bed must be friable and firm but not too fluffy and not too loose and light basically. And again those hard sitting soils can be difficult to, to manage. And I've got some photos here of some situations here. So the bottom right hand side is a, is a, is a Situation here of buffalo grass country and some heavy clay soils. Um, this farm is planting Lakina uh, with that photo there, as we can see. And and I think, or well, hopefully, you can see there that the soil is quite firm. Um, the tractor hasn't sunk into the ground too far, so it's quite firm, but but friable, not too fluffy. Therefore, it's probably a little bit rough and lumpy, but um, I understood that the sufficient was was quite okay in that case there. On the bottom right hand side of the of that screen there, we've got a um, a um, a disc opener going through some strips there that, that have been prepared. Again, you'll, you'll note that how firm that seed bed is. The tractor isn't leaving any indentations at all, um, but, it, but it's but it's friable, it's firm, not too fluffy, um, and everything's going quite nicely there. In the top right-hand corner, again, we've we've got um, a different planter um, going through some prepared strips there. Again, showing just that that fineness and that and that friability, but, but it's not too not, not not too fluffy either, so pretty much the ideal scenario. Again, some more photos of some fine friable seed beds, but not too not too fluffy or, 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 or light. So the photo on the left hand side shows that quite clearly in some young establishing Lakina seedlings that they are probably roughly about two weeks old. Again, um, the same again in the top right hand corner of that slide there. Um, and the bottom right hand corner, that photo there, just I put it in there to just illustrate um, that seed bed is far from ideal for planting into. So it's basically just one working after, um, or basically after a, a grass pasture there, and it's still still very rough, very lumpy, and so forth, and, and by no means um, suitable for planting into at that point in time. Okay, and during this fallow period and a, and a preparation period, we also want to kill kill weeds or, or existing pasture and that might take multiple cultivations or multiple sprays during the fallow period. So um, and a rough rule of thumb depending again as to what the situation is, you might need four or five or, or six or even more passes of either cultivations and or sprays to get an existing grass pasture in order to plant into. So if I just go back a step a couple of photos here, if you look at the bottom right, so the bottom left hand side, that, that paddock there, I understood that that guy took about six or seven workings to get that seed bed prepared. Okay, so when, so that's about preparation, so again it's about having, um, conserving moisture, getting a seed bed prepared so you, so you have good reliable establishment right from day one and, uh, and good weed control. So moving on from that, what about planting? Um, when should planting occur? Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, Lakina is very, very um, growth is driven by, by temperature. So we want to make sure that our soil temperatures are 18 degrees and rising, so therefore spring onwards. Uh, we want to make sure the soil profile is full of moisture or close to. We want to make sure our seed bed is well prepared, so weed free and, and fine and so forth, but not too fluffy. We want to make sure that the soil fertility or, or nutrient supply has been addressed, and we want to make sure that um, those things are uh, are addressed if required, and after sufficient rainfall, um, sorry, after su sufficient rainfall to wet the seed bed, uh, 
we want to make sure that we're planning at the right time to ensure there's a high chance of flight rainfall, as I mentioned earlier. We want to also plant early enough in the season to achieve a plant height, and I'm arbitrarily saying a metre plus high, before that winter or dry season or that all the first frost comes in. And, and again, it's about having a good, robust, big plant so it can survive those, those drier, cooler conditions and can bound away quickly in the spring or the, or the following spring. Planter, um, what sort of characteristics are, the, uh, are ideal for a, for a planter? And, and I'm suggesting for the most reliable establishment of Lakina, we want to make sure that, well not make sure, but I think ideally have a precision planter that can accurately meter the seed out, accurately place that seed into the, into the ground, and I'm suggesting here between two and four centimetres is probably ideal, but again will depend on, on the soil type. Um, has an opener that minimises the actual dis disturbance of the, of the soil, so a, a disc opener might be better um, therefore than I say a tine opener, but again tine openers can, can work quite happily too. I want to make sure that the ground unit follows the contour of the ground to again make sure that the seed is, is reliably placed at the accurate depth all the way through the paddock. I want to make sure the planter has press walls behind the opener that press to the side, not over the top. And these last three points are not critical, but ideal if, if, if it can have, have, have the ability to apply fertiliser or start a fertiliser away from the seed, can water inject the rhizobia and can apply some herbicide at planting. Um, so just straight behind. But again, those points aren't, aren't critical. Um, that would be ideal though. Got some photos here again of, of a planter. So again, this is a, the, the planter I showed before. So we've got a disc opener, John Deere Maximerge type planter here, um, where the actual depth control is provided by the, by the ground wheels here. So it's a precision planter with a plate, plate device that actually drops the seed out accurately along the row. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disc opener and press, has two press wheels behind the, the opener and presses to the side basically. This next planter here is a tine opener planter. It's a, I think it's a gyral lacina planter that, that, that they call it. Um, so it's got a tine opener there that runs through the ground and it's got two press wheels behind. The press wheels actually provide the, the depth control so there's no ability here in this case to uh, adjust the pressure of the press wheels unfortunately, but the press wheels are either side of the, of the planted seed. And this planter also has been retrofitted to be able to spray some herbicides straight after planting as, as the planting machine goes through. This third example here is I think it's an XL agriculture machine. So it's basically a three point linkage as all the rest of them have been. Um, this photo is, is shown from the front of the planter. This planter has, has a coulter at the front that sort of slices the soil open for the time behind to follow through. Um, it's got precision sort of plate boxes up here, so it plants two rows there, and it's got two twin press wheels behind that press on the side rather than over the top. There's also a couple of fertilizer boxes here, I believe. So this, this machine must have been set up sort of after being bought to actually also apply fertilizer as well. But just some examples of some of some good sort of uh, planters for for Lakina. Okay, what about post plant weed control? Pretty, pretty critical point to actually um, make sure that any weeds that come up after the lachina has been planted are controlled as well because lachina is a very slow plant to establish. It's putting a big deep taproot sort of down first and therefore the above ground growth is quite slow and it's a very poor competitor of fast growing weeds, particularly in the first month or two. So the post plant weed control can be done either through herbicides or through cultivation. If you plan on going down the herbicide route, there are a couple of options. So Controlling grasses through herbicides is, uh, is, is relatively easy. Um, there is a registered product called Fusilade Fort. Um, registered rates are roughly between 1.6 litres and 3.3 litres per hectare. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a contact herbicide that has to be sprayed onto actively growing weeds, only controls grasses. Controlling broadleaf weeds, including other legumes, can be quite difficult in Lakina and, and that's probably where most of the issue comes from. There is a product, um, or a range of products called Spinnaker or Maze or Impale. There's, there's quite a few different trade names of that particular chemical. Um, in Masapur, I think it's pronounced. Um, and that product is a residual herbicide that will control broadleaf weeds and quite a few grasses for up to six months. But needs to be applied onto a prepared seed bed and have rainfall to incorporate that product for it to actively work. Um, 
therefore won't won't kill or affect any legumes. So if you've got other legumes like wind cassia or stylos or or, or cilantro or butterfly pea, whatever it might be, they won't be controlled. And if there's been any history of those legumes in that paddock beforehand, they might come up and and um, and cause some issues potentially. Also, if if you have the ability to to source or have some shielded sprays, they can also be quite useful to to use some other 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 herbicides. But just be aware of registrations with those too. The second option for controlling weeds post planting is for cultivation, and that's I suppose historically how, how weeds have been controlled. Um, numerous inero cultivation machines are, are out there and, and are, are available. Um, requires obviously you know quite precise driving and so forth to make sure you don't drive over the roads or take any roads out, but but can can work quite quite happily. Um, and there's also a product or, or a device called a Yetta wheel that that runs over the Lakina row to take out any little, little weirdly, any seedlings or weed seedlings that come up in the row without pulling out the actual um, Lakina itself. And, and, and there are, I think there, there's a photo or two in the Lakina book, the actual MLA Lakina book. Um, so okay, so just a bit, bit more detail about post-plant weed control. So generally what happens is that in a typical, in a typical scenario, the seedbed is prepared, moisture is stored, um, and, and that could occur, you know, like, like, like I mentioned earlier, between six months or 12 months period of time. Planting rain occurs, um, and then either a, a roundup or, or, or similar spray is, is applied onto the actual prepared areas once the ground is dry enough. So basically, a pre plant um, application of herbicide to control weeds. Then planting occurs, and then spinnaker is sprayed or equivalent to over the planted rows. The alternative is, is to plant and spray with Roundup and Spinnaker together over the planted rows, uh, and that could be done either if you've got a boom behind the planter, as I showed before, or a separate sort of spray with it that comes after the planting operation. So, um, yeah, Roundup is, is compatible with, with Spinnaker or with equivalent two to actually put together, and therefore will provide contact and immediate weed control plus that longer term control with that Spinnaker product. And then spray with fuselade or something similar uh, later if there are more grasses that might come up if required. So there is the ability to, to come back again and spray more fuselade if, if, if required to control more grasses if they do come up and are causing issues. What about insect control? Um, big issue or can be an issue particularly if you're coming out of a, an existing grass pasture and both above and below insects can be an issue in Lakina systems. So um, that there is a product or a or a concept called beetle bait, which is Laws Ban, which is a insecticide, some crack grain and vegetable oil that, that is mixed together, um, and that's been quite reliably used by many, many graziers who have established Lakina, and that's primarily targeting the above ground insects. There is potential for seed coating, although not registered at this point in time, and those seed coatings can control below ground insects, um, but again, there's no registrations. And there's also an unknown impact on the rosavia survivability, so um, might not be that useful ultimately. That was the last point there. Okay, so in summary, um, getting establishment can be can be can be tricky with Lakina. Um, has been one of the most unreliable legumes to establish in the past, but with these agronomic principles here, has become one of the more reliable ones to establish. Um, I'm suggesting here grazies must follow good agronomic practices to obtain the the reliability or success of planting Lakina. Um, yes, yeah, basically storing moisture, paddock selection um, and planting are probably the, the most critical aspects of, of establishment. But there are a range of aspects though, you know, seed quality is important as I mentioned earlier. So there's a range of issues there to consider. But getting the right paddock to start with, having good adequate moisture before you plant and planting on time in the moisture with a good plant, a good seed and so forth are all critical aspects to make sure that you can reliably establish Lakina.